Red Rover, Red Rover, let Anna come over. Now, admittedly, this game had already passed by me by the time I was in school, but my dad happened to tell me about it. See, it got banned because it was too violent. Red Rover apparently was too hard on kids, but anyway, the game was divided up in two sides. On one side, you had each, or each side linked up arms together, and they would form a line, and they would call over, well, they would say, Red Rover, Red Rover, let Anna or let Tom come over. And they would come running over. And if they broke through that line, then they would be able to take two people with them. They'd be able to break that chain, that chain of teams, and bring them over to their side. And they was, this would go back and forth until you were left with one person on one of the teams. It's awful hard to link arms with yourself, isn't it? So anyhow, but this game, it reminds us of something that... Well, many games do, actually. Two different sides. Now, in Red Rover, there are two distinct sides. You're on one side, or you're on the other side. There's not a middle side. You can't stand in the middle of the playing field. And Jesus kind of gets at this today in our gospel, doesn't he? In Matthew chapter 25, he said that there is two sides. There's a left side and a right side. There's a, go a side with goats on it and a side with sheep on it. There are no gray areas. Now, this may be a little radical. First of all, because many of us are not shepherds, we're a little removed from that, even if we do have sheep and goats in the valley here. But second of all, we don't like this idea of no gray area. Because when we don't have gray areas, well, it takes away that room for wiggle. It takes away that room for, well, someone to have a difference of opinion. It removes that idea of tolerance, doesn't it? Because when there's no gray area, either it's right or it's wrong. Right. You're either a sheep or you're a goat. Now let's look at our first problem. Now, The sheep and the goats mixed together. Now even though we're not shepherds, we, we can at least get a little idea of what's going on here. And if you've ever seen sheep and goats, you know that they are different. And in the ancient Near East, Jesus was not just using a, well, an illustration that he thought, well, this could work, but he knew his audience. And on the one side, you had the sheep and the goats mixed together because of the fact that the land was so arid. And so they would put the sheep and the goats, although very different, in the fields together so that they could, one, make sure they got fed, but two, protect them from any bears or lions or tigers, oh my. And so, he had those, and so you would have those sheep and goats combined together. So not so off the wall here, actually, when we understand it. Now at night, they would separate them. The sheep would go to one pasture, the goats to the other. Because although sheep are foolish, one of the good tra traits about them are the fact that they also have a gentle disposition for the most part. As foolish as they are, they are happy most of the time uh, with their certain needs met. Goats, on the other hand, well, you've all been probably been to a petting zoo at least one time or another. You know that goats are a bit more, well, aggressive might be the word to say. Because they will challenge one another. They even have horns on their heads. They'll even walk up to you and they'll start eating your clothing if you're not paying attention. Goats and sheep don't necessarily get, to long, get along, so the only time you're going to see them combined is that they can eat. So the separation is not so off the wall. And it really, when we look at the parable itself, as radical as it is, it's not so radical for our understanding. Because we understand exactly what Jesus is getting at here. There's not much confusion in our minds, is there? There's a side that follows Christ, a side that doesn't follow Christ. A side that believes in Christ for their salvation, a side that doesn't. Simple as that, right? So why don't we stop there? Well, then you won't get your money's worth. No, just, no, but actually, in all seriousness, when we look at this parable, we struggle with it because of the fact that the sheep and the goats, this idea of the gray area is gone. And it, even more than that, we know that it's not just referring to people outside the church. People outside the window there. But literally, these sheep and goats that we're talking about are people who are sitting right among us. These sheep and goats we're talking about, it's our hairdressers. It's our, the guy who comes and mows our lawns. It's the nice clerk at Walmart. It could even be someone in our own family, one of our close friends. And even sitting among us, there could be goats among the sheep. And this is a scary thought. Not so much because we, 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 we haven't thought of this before, but because it forces us to ask the question, am I a sheep or am I a goat? Are you sheep or are you goats? 
I heard someone say sheep. But as we think about that, think about what it means to be a sheep. Think about what it means to actually carry out the role of a sheep. And let's go back to our gospel lesson today. If you have your bulletin in front of you, we're going to Matthew chapter 25. And we're just going to go to 35 and 36. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Wow, it's actually a really beautiful text, isn't it? Because you hear about someone who is living out their life of faith. They are living out and carrying out what God has commanded them to do. So let's go down that list. How are you guys doing? Have you fed the hungry? Given a drink to the thirsty? Clothed the, clothed the naked? Provi- opened your home to a stranger? Taken care of someone who is sick? Gone to visit someone in prison? How are you guys doing? Maybe you could say yes to a couple of those. You could say, yeah, I've, I fed the hungry. I've, I, I bring a bag of groceries. Yeah, I've even br- brought a drink to someone who is thirsty, sitting outside of Ons. Oh, and that one time I went to visit Uncle Mike in prison, so, so I should be covered, right? Except for when we start to look at the text. We're not talking about a one-time thing. We're not talking about a two-time thing. We're not talking about a 15-time thing. When we look at this, this is a command to every thirsty person, every hungry person, every sick person, every naked person, every person in prison, every stranger out there. How are you guys doing? Are you sheep or goats? Because that's an awful high call for sheep, isn't it? Sheep, isn't it? It's an awful high expectation list for sheep, isn't it? To be counted in that category. Not just one of those things, but all those things. Even if you could do all those things, though, you still would not be right with God. You still could not put yourself in the sheep pen. See, we have all, we have all sinned. We have all broken God's law. And so even our very acts are worthless. And the reading I have for you right now is from Isaiah 64, and it's very familiar, but I think a lot of times we don't even read the second half of the verse because we get caught up on the first half. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags, but things go downhill from here. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Not only are we filthy, rotten, no good sinners, but even beyond that, we are like a leaf that is blown away. Our sin sweeps into our life, and it blows, and it catches us, and it carries us away. It keeps moving us along. And so even if we wanted to fight back, have you ever watched a, wind, a leaf in the wind? There's no chance of it fighting. It's getting carried away. And that's exactly where we are with our sin. And that is exactly why even if we try to keep and we're able to feed every hungry person, give every thirsty person a drink, and so on, we would fail. So are you a sheep or a goat? We're put in quite an uncomfortable spot, aren't we? when we start to look at this text as though it says that we have to carry out all these sheeply duties. We're put in a very uncomfortable position because we know that no matter how hard we've tried, we have not kept these things. And even sometimes we don't even try to keep uh, do any of these things. We know that some days we wake up and it's just enough for us to try to live a good life. For we like sheep have gone astray. And thanks be to God, there is a good shepherd. This is from Ezekiel 34. For this is what the Lord God says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I myself will tend my sheep And will have them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. No, even more than even more than than looking at 
us as sheep and goats. We know that it doesn't come down to what we have done, but to what God has done. The fact that He has chosen us. The fact that He has picked us, and He has done that through the waters of holy baptism. He has placed His name upon our hearts in the waters of holy baptism, and He has made us His sheep. Not because we lived a good life. Not because we obeyed His commands perfectly. Not because we've lived up and taken care of the sick or hungry. But out of His grace for us. The richness of His grace. He went to the cross and as a lamb to the slaughter gave His life. So that we would not be separated from our Lord. But that we would be with Him. That we would know His promises. That we would know His comfort. He looked at us. And He didn't see us merely as the goats that we were because we were firmly in that goat pen. But He saw us as sheep. As children who needed redemption. As people who needed to be healed. And what a beautiful message this is because it is that message of comfort that we rely on. It's that message of comfort that points us to 1 Corinthians 15 where we do have that hope of the resurrection. It's that message of comfort that reassures us that no matter how few of these sheeply duties we've carried out, that our God did not save us because of those, because of His great love for us. But we like to get caught up in that, don't we? And in fact, we have a favorite verse. I think many of us do, at least, or at least I do. Well, favorite two verses. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And we love these verses because it says, I am all set, I'm good to go. But a lot of times we leave off verse 10. Well, let's look at 8 and 9 for a minute here. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the free gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. And we like to close our Bibles right there and say, all right, I'm all set. And that's true. We are all set. We are saved. There's nothing more we can do. But then verse 10 comes along. Paul uh, kind of doesn't end his paragraph there, but he, he continues on. For, a God, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Not only are we created to do good works, but God has already prepared them in advance for us to do. He has already placed those good works into our lives, those things He's expecting of us. And now many, t- and we, we oftentimes get, get caught, stop right there and know, and know with full assurance that we don't have to save ourselves, that we can't save ourselves. But we don't keep going. We stop at salvation. We sit down in our pasture, our pews, and we get comfortable. And we say, wait. I'm all set until the end of time. I'm looking forward to the last day or my last day when I will join the Lord. But that is not where Christ stops. That's not where Paul stops, is it? He keeps going. Salvation is the starting point. It is the spring point. It is the spot where he he starts us off. He starts us off for that life of sanctification. That life of holiness to the Lord. Literally, sanctification means set apart. Different. So as sheep, this is a description of what we are to do. This is not a description of how we are to save ourselves, but a description of how we are to live now that we have been saved. Now that we have been turned from goatness to sheepness. And that means that it is more than just being comfortable. More than just sitting in a pew. But part of our calling as Christians, our mandate is, is to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give a drink to the thirsty, visit those in prison, invite strangers. But as a mandate, we have the opportunity as saved people of God to decide, are we going to follow Christ's mandate? Or are we going to live comfortably without the fear of anybody knowing the difference anyway? Are we going to live comfortably because we know that, well, no one's going to check up on me because I won't check up on them? Are we going to live as sheep who are all but just about goats? So back to our first question. Are you sheep or are you goats? Thankfully, we are sheep. 
we have been resurrected by Christ. We have been made new and made alive through baptism. We've been washed whiter than snow and made clean. And as those sheep then, we are called. We are called to care for those less fortunate. We are called to take care of those in need. You know, a lot of times we do, we get caught up and we stop because we don't like to talk about good works. But we have examples of the good works that are being done, that have been done. Many of us know the name Mother Teresa. And although she's died now, she has lived on, hasn't she? Her name has lived on. Not because of what she did for herself, but what she did for others. And not because she did it in her name, but she did it in the Lord's name. That's one of the neat things about helping others and caring for others in the name of the Lord. Is that it's not merely something that, that we have to do as an obligation, but over time, we start to do it out of joy. We start to do it because it's the thing that we see how God works through our hands. How He makes them righteous. Just, just as we were dead. And, cr- and the Spirit breathed life into us. He also covers our works with His glory that they may be a reflection of God's love. And this doesn't just mean that you, on Sunday morning you need to be an elder who serves communion. An LWML lady throughout the week who, hel- who enjoys the meetings and discussion. You don't have to be an usher. You don't have to be a lay reader. These are all good things to do to help serve the church, to carry out the ministries of the church. But God, He ordains all these things. I know we don't often use that word ordained outside of, uh, outside of an ordination of a pastor. But God ordains these good works. In advance, He has prepared for us to do. He's prepared them and set aside for us as we live our day-to-day life. Many of you are parents, if not parents, grandparents even. And by being, as parent, being parents and grandparents, You can carry out the works of God in your life. All of you are sons and daughters. And as sons of daughters, you have the uh, sons and daughters, you have the opportunity to carry out God's work, to live a life reflecting His love. And even in our day to day life, we may not think much of it because there's not special words or a special prayer we say, but by, by the way we live, by the work of the Spirit in our lives, it shows that we are not goats, but sheep. We have that privilege. That privilege of taking part in changing lives. In changing the hearts of people who are lost and dying. Hopeless. Those people who were in the same place we were until Christ said, Come. Come unto me. When He called us out of the tomb of death, of sin, He called us to a life a life here on earth to live as resurrected saints, but even a life on the last day when we'll join Him forever in heaven. Not because of our works, not because of being the perfect sheep, but because of the fact that Christ has risen. Alleluia! Christ has risen! He has risen indeed! Alleluia! Alleluia! Our Lord indeed, because He rose, we will rise with Him on the last day. We will rise with Him. And we will celebrate. We'll celebrate because there will be no longer any need. And we will be in the presence. His presence. His holy presence. Forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You have given us new life. That You have, re- that you have resurrected our dead worthless souls and made them made them alive breathing able to to serve you and share your love with others lord we thank you that you have taken our works and not because they are our works but because they because of your holy spirit have made them holy we pray that each day lord that we would carry out those good works in our lives that we would not just stop at being justified people, people that have been made holy, but that we would carry it, carry it beyond these walls, that we would carry that love to our neighbor, that they may too know your forgiveness, that they may too know that through as a good shepherd, that you desire all your sheep to come to you, just as 99 who are following you, and you sought after the one, Help us to have that same desire in our hearts. To seek, all, seek after that one 
who doesn't know You. Lord, we pray that You would strengthen us, that You would fill us with joy. And even as we prepare for Your birth and as we prepare for, for the end of this year, knowing that You have not returned yet, that we do have the full assurance that one day You will return. You will call us home, and as a good shepherd, You will bind up our wounds and renew us that we may live with You forever and ever. Amen.